that's the end. Now I want to tell you one thing before we go about the peremptory norms. I published a paper in Korea within the last couple of years, I forget when it was, where I examined these peremptory norms. And the question was, if all the countries are enslaving and torturing and genociding people, then how can you say we have peremptory norms prohibiting them? Torture, for example. My dad told me, he was a military person, my father, he told me years ago, oh yes, everyone tortures everyone. You must torture, that's part of the system. He, and he actually said it in those tones. I'm emulating my father now. Oh yes, you must torture people, that's the system. That's natural. Everyone does it. I found out in my research that there's at least 167 countries evincing evidence of torture today. And the research further showed that the reason why they torture people is specifically so that other people find out that the torture has taken place. Then you, right, then you say, oh, I'm scared. Look, they tortured him, I hope they don't torture me. And that's how you get governed. Right. By vicarious witnessing. Well said. Could you just go back to that last slide because it was saying treaties are void if they conflict with a peremptory norm. Yes, that's right. If, if you can't, under the law of treaties, it doesn't matter, it's okay, we'll just say it. Uh, if, if you execute a treaty that conflicts with those, any of those norms, such as slavery, we'll just stay with slavery right now because I'll talk about that in a moment, the treaty's void. Now, if you're, in your treaty you're offering people good jobs, the treaty's void. Why would you need a job? Why can't you just go out there and do something and alienate the value of your work publicly? Why do you have to do it through someone else? Prince Charles issued a statement a few years ago saying he was very worried about corporate capitalism taking over and he wanted the reinstitution of the cooperatives and he was very quickly shut up. Yes, ma'am. So are you saying that we should go towards Ubuntu country communalism or communalism as opposed to moving away from money? which is the part that's actually enslaving us. Well, there's money in communism too. What about barter system? Yeah. Well, we, uh... well, let me just answer her question <coughs> first. Communism is, is no, communism simply an analysis. Communalism, not communism. Oh, not communism. No, Are you not referring to Marx at all? Are you referring to Marx? No. No, okay. Although I haven't read that. Yeah, but communalism is more where everyone is treated well, they did it in Israel. All the young people can, can go and work on the kibbutz. And they're all growing the fruit together and they're living together and they meet their future spouses there and they have a lovely time for a few years. That works there. No reason why it shouldn't work here. Young people love doing that kind of thing. Well, that was what the term applies to this but it's, it's the same in all society, like you're talking about how they conquer and all that. If it, like uh, in jails, it's the same thing. When you go to the jail, if, you, if you're scared, you pick out the strongest person in the jail and you fight them. Mm. Even if you lose, people will be wary of you because they look at it's a psychological yes, that's right. profile. Well, if he's willing to take that big fella on, what would he so do to me? So you come in at a big ship and you shoot a few people. Yeah. And everyone's scared. Yeah. Naturally. That's only natural. Okay, now I just want to tie it together for you now before I finish up. I know I've spoken for a long time. Uh, under the laws of war, it's very clearly stated that the main method of executing war is by deceit. Which is why you don't need an army to win a war. What you need is military advisors who can explain to you how to manipulate the other party, usually with manoeuvre warfare and with rhetoric, so that you never have to fight. Now, many thousands of years ago, there was a great rhetorician called Georgius, G-O-R-G, 
I-A-S. Georges. And not gorgeous. Not gorgeous. But the person he wrote about was gorgeous. <laughs> he wrote about Helen of Troy, and she was a very pretty girl. And she was able to twist all the boys around, around her little finger. Wouldn't you like to be able to do that? Yeah. <laughs> she could already do it. Okay. And, uh, but she was quite an evil woman, unlike you. And she did terrible things in society, and she created big problems. And she, uh, she fell in love with someone specifically for a political purpose. Georges wrote what's called an encomium, which is an ancient Greek form of uh, rhetoric, which is a song of praise. An encomium is a song of praise. Georges wrote the encomium to Helen. And in this encomium, which is regarded as the last word on manipulation by words and deceiving people, he was able to prove conclusively that she was a lovely girl, and none of this was her fault. The encomium to Helen. And the commentators and the uh, scholars who talk about the... This is the basis of the whole thing. The scholars say that the power of words are absolutely is absolutely tyrannical. Mm. It's a sovereign that can't be beaten. Now, we don't educate the children in the schools anymore in the ancient rhetoric. We mustn't do that, otherwise they might have power. But you can still get a good classical education in Britain and go into government service and go and enslave people all around the world. You know, one of the greatest things that happened in common... Uh, in, in the education system after the... Well, when, about the end of the 60s, they took out of the English grammar system the ability to... Te uh, the, the, the unit that teaches them how to write poetry and interpret poetry in the words of the poems. That's right. They took it out. That's right. I was in school in the 60s, I remember. Hey? Yeah, yeah, but they... they yeah. yeah, but it depends on the teacher. It's not, a, not now part of the curriculum, obligatory... Uh, teaching, um, because they don't want kids to understand the words and how to write poetry because of the same, what he's talking about, what Gary's talking about. Yes. And so, so if, you, if, you, if, if they take the inability to write poems and write poetry and put words together like that there, well, then you can't manipulate the minds of others. Right. Because so you Mr. can manipulate Sprott. the minds of others by poetry. Yeah. A very Sing, good student sing them, in the that's background, true. Mr. Sprocket, uh, wants to speak. And um, I want to ask you a question. Yeah. Based upon what you've heard today, Mr. Sprocket, how could you con how could you counteract this mass deceit that goes on? Oh, it's very difficult. I don't think I've got the answers, I don't think I've the other answers. But and one of the things what most of us would think. Yeah. But one of the things that I, I notice a lot of that, you know, with the retrospect and you know, you bring in uh, Helen of Troy, is that I see a lot of what they call the Spartacus way of, 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 um, of manner of um, governance, you know. You can rob, steal, bash, do whatever you want, but just don't get caught. And that seems to be like our government. Oh, you can do whatever we want, well, unless you don't, until you get caught. They based it on John's Leviathan. John Hobbes wrote that the government has behind it a Leviathan which is basically a dragon or a serpent. And it's a semi-uncontrollable evil force that the government can use to keep people in line. Such as, for example, torture, such as, for example, an encomium or an invective or any of the other levels of oratory. And, and you've got this leviathan working in society. It's, a, it's an entity, a monster so big that can't be counteracted. If you're going to set up a government, you've got to have a leviathan. Otherwise, the leviathan from the government next door will kill your leviathan. Is that what you call fear of the unknown? Is that the leviathan, like the dragon, like the unknown? 
they mix the thing they, they used to, Might be. They know it. Might be. Whereas if, if they try and step outside of the norm, the fear of not knowing what's there well, holds them in, in the same You educate the children in the usual way about right and wrong, yep. and then the children exhibit certain behaviour, and if anything goes wrong, you have to counsel the children as they get older, and if counselling doesn't work, then you gradually escalate until, if they're a danger to the community, you have to remove them from contact with people they might be, they might victimise. Which is why Michael said earlier on that some of the people in jail maybe you don't want to release right now. That's got to be discussed. But on, on that, the, the, the other thing that we, a lot of our people don't recognise, and I thank Gary for bringing this up, because what our people don't recognise is how the British, when they started realising a little bit more from the, uh, those anthropolo anthropologists and, um, and eth ethnologists around this country in the, 19, in the 1800s and 19, early 1920s and 30s and 40s, our people, were, our people are very trusting, yeah? And they tell stories. And they tell stories about, you know, the serpent and they tell stories about thing and, and they talk about how he travelled, which way he travelled, yeah? But you see, the British were smart because they needed to kill him. They needed to stop St. that. St George and the Dragon, that's yes. their myth. They yeah. kill all the, all the other Leviathans. That's right. And they did it in Germany through a bloke called, um, what's his name? Um, um, uh, what's that fellow's name? The, Hitler? No, no. Yeah, him too, but... <laughs> No, Siegfried. Siegfried, yeah? Or Freud. Yeah, Siegfried. No, Siegfried. Siegfried killed the dragon in, in Bonn yes. on that mountain, yeah? Yeah, that's Siegfried. a myth yeah. common to many. Well, it's the same. No, it's no, no. Well, I've been there. I've, be, I've been to this place, yeah? And I looked at this place where Siegfried killed the dragon, mm. yeah? And I went through and I looked at... And it's interesting because they got this monument there and it's a round, circular building and... And then you go up two steps and you've got this round floor and all these decorations on it. And, um, and I, I never took much notice to what's on the what's floor. What's it made out of? Yeah, eh? What's it made out of? A stone. Stone? Stone, yeah. So, but hang on. That's a marker for yeah. the state. But, but listen to this one now. This is very important because it relates to our serpent here, mm. yeah? So I, I, I would get taken to this place onto this mountain. And then when I'm on the mountain... Um, looking at this place and looking at the caves. I was taken to the caves where Siegfried, where the dragon was. And so I had to work out, well, OK, why did he kill the dragon? What was wrong here? What, what was this all about? And so having gone there, then I'm looking at these paintings around the wall. Okay? And, um, and I see Siegfried and his mate. You know, Siegfried painting his horse there with all his cavalry gear, and etc. And then Siegfried, like... Over he's killed the dragon, but he's not taken the dragon's body out of the cave. The dead dragon stays there, but the person he's taken out is a woman in a white dress. Yeah? The soul of the dragon. The so no, yeah, and the soul of the dragon yeah. is the spirit of the woman. And back home in my country, mm -hmm. yeah, that dragon or the crocodile who we talk about up there, <coughs> He took them woman broke to the creator. And so he was the one, and so he got punished to make sure that he looked after that woman place, not allowed to let anyone there. That's his punishment. He's permanently looking after that place. He got to look after, he's not allowed to touch it. So to get to that woman and destroy her, you have to kill that dragon. You have to kill that spirit. Yeah? And if you kill that spirit that's protecting him, you get the power. And you take the power away. Now I'll now, tell you. What, what, one ahead. more, one more. So they took me out of there and they said, we want to take you up here and show you something else. So I walked up on top of this mountain, round, there's a walkway. And so when you get around, you're looking straight down on the Rhine River and the city of Bonn. Yeah? And so up the top there, when I get up there, there's this big quarry. Half the mountain is cut away. And I'm looking, I said, yeah, a funny place to have a quarry on top of the mountain. What, what happened up here? They said, no, all, they cut all these rocks here, the masons, stone masons. They cut all the rocks and they rolled it all down the hill down to the bottom. They looked where the river is and they landed all down there. And I said, what'd they do with it all? They said, they put it on, onto barges, 
took it down the river to a place called Cologne. And from them rocks... This is full of stone buildings. Yeah, but, but the most important building there is the Dome of Cologne. Right. right. This big monstrosity, this big church sitting there, yeah? And it was all built from that stone <laughs> on that mountain. Now, you go to Bonn, you go to Cologne, and you have a look at all these pictures in their museums about the destruction, the bombing destruction by the British and, and allies, but mainly the British, who bombed Cologne to pieces. But when you look at the pictures, every house within one block around that church is totally destroyed. But the church had one window broken from a rock. Now, those blokes did not have guided missiles. They were just dropping bombs indiscriminately. But not one bomb hit that church, but it destroyed everything around it. Right? So the power of this yeah, is enormous. And you really don't understand it until you actually see what, how this happened. And then you, that, so anyway, they took me to another place. And I, I, I'm, I want to say this because it relates to our law, our dreaming. Yeah? And when, they, when I went back, they took me to another place where the, where the women's power is, where the women's story is. And they wanted me to go there. And I said, no, I can't go there because I'm... They said, no, come, come. We just want you to have a look at something and we want you to tell us this thing. So I, I'm walking along and then all of a sudden I come to this clump of rocks on the side of the mountain and there's two trees, just like in Alice Springs, them two trees that got burnt down, the two... The twin gums. There's two twin gums sitting in this bloody painting. Gum trees, sitting in this painting, in 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 Germany, yeah, yeah, and no, it's there, right? So anyway, and then I'm walking past this thing, and then all of a sudden I hear music, and I thought I was going bloody mad, you know, and I'm walking with these people, and then I could hear this music, and it was a flute, and I'm thinking, um, all right, I saw something back there in that building on that mountain. There was also another picture in there, and then my mind clicked, and I said, I'm not going down there, I'm going now, I'm going back this way, I can hear that fellow playing that music, yeah, I'm pissing off, I'm out of here, yeah? And so, being the superstitious black fellow I am, I'm in a strange country, if I was in my old country, I'd be able to deal with it, but I could no way in the world I could deal with that. So I turned around, I went back, and I said, now, tomorrow morning, are we going back to that bloody thing up there on that mountain, I want to have a look at something. When we went on the mountain, yeah, <coughs> because they took that woman out of there, those fellas also painted a picture and put those twin trees in them rocks there on a painting. And there was a fella sitting in that painting called Pan with his flute. Mm. Yeah? Heard I heard that Which music. Which links it back a few more 10,000 years. Now, so, so here I am in this strange country reading all their symbolism and I understood every bloody yeah, aspect of it. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm telling them this. And they said, how do you know that? I said, because that's what I can see. Yeah. And they said to me, you, but you've never read any of this. I said, I don't even know how to read bloody German, so what the hell, you know, I'm reading country. I'm, reading country. I'm not reading anything else. Because ancient lore is transmitted that transmitted way. Transmitted that way. see it instantly. That's right. And so when they came here, they destroyed all these <laughs> things. And then I began to realise over there that all them bloody, what do you call them, monasteries, those uh, monasteries that they built with them monks, eh? not monkeys, but monks, yeah, them fellas, they put all those monasteries on top of all the ancient story places to shut them down. Same as they did here. Yeah. Now, Hitler, they took me to one more place, and I'll finish it, they took me to one more place where Hitler got his power from and where all his senior top men in the, in the Third Reich oh, yes. had to swear yeah. allegiance to him and the Third Reich, and they went to a witch's altar. In the, in the mount, on a mountain where this big rock is, and that's where they all had to commit themselves to the third yes. rake, yeah. at a witch's place. Now, what I want to do now is help Mr. Sprocket see his way through. <laughs> because like all of us, he said, I don't, wouldn't know where to start with that. <coughs> now, who runs the country? The politicians or the officials? The officials run the country. Politicians have never run countries. They just articulate what they're told to articulate. They want to get elected so they can have lovely position and mouth whatever they're 
told to mouth them, they're basically empty vessels. Mm. The problem we have here in Australia is even more acute in the United States. The way it's been dealt with in the state of New York is as follows. There are now many, many private legislatures in New York. And they have, instead of empty vessel idiots elected by idiots, they have very smart people. And these people go out into the field using standard research techniques. They identify the problems of the population. They carefully identify with the population what methods of resolving the problem would be acceptable to the population. Then they go back into their think tank and they research, they look at the past, they look at the myths, they see what's acceptable, what would, be, what would work, what's just, what has propriety, and they formulate a plan. Then they take it back to the people and test it on the people. And they do this several times until finally they have two things. One, a statute, and two, a complete report of all their reasoning and all their research that shows why the statute is just, proper, workable, decent, and what the reasoning is. And then who do they take that information to? The officials who run the state of New York government. And the officials overbear the will of the politicians, and many times those statutes become law in the state of New York. Now, who else has done this? You have to see that if you did that, you wouldn't ever need elections. Well, that's the way they run China. And in every city in China, they have what's called an Academy of Social Sciences. And it's full of very smart people, and they're smart. I'm telling you, they're smart. And they do this same process, out to the population, back, do all the research, iterate round and round and round, and when it's finally done, could take years to get it done properly, they send it up to Beijing, Xi Jinping's people look at it, and if it's approved, bang, goes to the annual legislature and gets rubber stamped as a statute and its law, and it solves the problems. And what they've got over there is a society where the young people can walk the streets at 11 o'clock at night and there's no crime, and they're very proud of this. That's how you can do it. Mm. You can actually do it now because the average public servant is a decent person who's interested in the community, the average public servant. Mm. And if you do reasoned statutes, carefully documented like that, you'll just be all over the politicians and it'll all be over. On, um, just on that point, the, um, I think it's about, about seven months ago now, or six months ago, um, people in Tennant Creek and Northern Territorians might be able to help me here. Um, at Tennant Creek, no, not, not Tennant Creek, Catherine, at Catherine, um, because of the crime that was occurring up there, um, the elders wanted to take back control. Yeah. Yeah. And so what the elders did was that they put together a justice, an elders justice council or a, a law council, yeah? And they went to the Northern Territory government and said, we put this together because you fellas can't handle our children. You can't control the youth. You can't control the wrongdoings. Yeah, they've made it worse. But, but we can do it under our law, right? And so... All of a sudden, Turnbull, before, while he was Prime Minister, Turnbull and Scullion turned up in, uh, in Catherine, and they actually decided then that the Commonwealth would recognise that Elders Law Council and say they now have legitimacy and they've taken control over their youth. And Scullion wouldn't have done that without Turnbull next to him, would he? That's correct. So, so now that's, that's an acceptable practice. I, Ellie and I went up, and because I've, I've always recorded this here as evidence, we went to um, Northern Territory about two years ago, and um, we went up there to meet with Dr. Um, what's his name? That Dr. Um, Ginny, um, Dr. Ginjini, and he was talking about sovereignty. He was asking about sovereignty and how do we 
how do we do these things and get control? And I said, well, you're, you're, you're recognised within the white system as an authority builder of the Yulngu. And so we talked about how does he apply the rules. And one of the things that he said was that he said, the reason we don't have white settlement in Arnhem Land is because our people just pushed them out. They just kept killing them, driving them out, yeah? So they left Arnhem Land alone. And so the boundaries around, so Barunga and all those places, Borulula and other places, so they, mob, they, they stayed out of that country. And that's why they now recognise the self-governance. They're, they're self-governing themselves under their law and culture. And then when I talked to Dr Jin Jinny, he, um, I was talking to him about what I said about, you know, our people not have, them not having jurisdiction over us. So he went and thought about that, and then all of a sudden I find that Jinjini now goes into the courts in Darwin, and any of his youth from his country, Yolngu, he goes and he tells the court, you have no jurisdiction, and he takes them out of the court and takes them back home to his country. Yeah? Now, what we need to do as part of this process, and what you, what, you, know, what you were saying about the treaty process, you know, the treaty process is not going to work. That's for us. It That's will not work. Well, not with these people, anyhow. No, but what I said <coughs> there, if you look at what I was presenting this morning to you all, where I was saying that, you know, the Attorney General during the Fraser's government time was saying that the, that the NAC, because we agreed to negotiate a national treaty, and then all of a sudden the Attorney General saying, because of international law, it has to be governed by international law, the, if you use the word treaty, right, if it's not specifically stated that it's the domestic treaty. So that, but that creates problems still in legal theory. So what you've got now is where these blackfellas are starting to say, we're doing this and we're taking power back under our rule. And as Gary was talking there when I was quoting all them court cases and all those different things, so because they've recognised now Maba being one of them, where it recognises Aboriginal law, yeah, and that it can, an Aboriginal law is not in a, not alienable by the white system, so the Parliament can't change our law, can't write anything about our law. That Mabo decision there now gives us all the sovereign authority that we need. But you don't have to recognise the whole of Mabo. No, just you that just section. There's just the snippets you want. Yeah, just in part. Just approve That's right. only the snippets. You That's want. right. And yeah. yeah, and so we only use that there because. Because, you see, under the definition of um, uh, a legal definition called, um, what do you call it, um, um, admissions against interest, this is the highest form of evidence there that's is right. in right. any court, right? And so that's an admission against interest. The court made that decision, the highest court in this land. And it also said that they, it's an inalienable right and this parliament, no parliament in Australia or legal system can change our law. By the okay? way... In the Talmudic law, we have 18 levels of admissions against interest. In the Jewish law. It's extremely well developed. Yeah. So, given that be, to be the case, I, 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 as Gary, as we were talking about it this morning, and, and I, it never really dawned on me, and I had no concept of that legal provision, that all those admissions that we now have recognising Aboriginal law in this country constitutes an admission against their interest. And you bind it up in a lovely binder. And we, we, so we, yeah, so we put it all together and because my mob have got their own state seal mm. and we've written all that stuff off to the Crown and we've written it all off to the United Nations and done all the accessions, we just document that, put all that together and we say, we don't have to treaty with Australia, you've recognised everything and we have sovereign control over our country, piss off. That's right. Now, before I leave, are there any more questions? Just one more. Yeah. When, when, so any treaty, um, so let's say, okay, I've done that with my mob. I will do that now that I go home, I've got a job straight away. I'll have it all done by the end of next week. It's beautiful, um, isn't it? Oh, it's lovely. I just bring the elders together. We're meeting next week anyway down at the lake, so I've got all my people you there. You cite the article from the UN yeah. Convention? For yeah, the... that's right. Yeah. I will. So, and we'll do the diplomatic paper. I'll get yeah. you to show me how to do that. But 
what we need to do is to get this information to our people out there on the ground so that they know, yeah? And we know how to make this happen. So, for example, you mob now, Central Aranda, yeah? So you, d because you've got the boundaries of your clan within that Central Aranda, you know exactly where that country is, yeah? You know exactly where your boundaries are. So, if you do that, and you be successful at that, then th that area that they belong to covers the whole township of Alice Springs. Now, there's all sorts of problems that you can create for the, for, for the Australian government. And the Americans are going to panic. Because Pine Gap's in, because the Pine Gap's in your boundary. What's yeah? very interesting is, is as soon as you do that, they'll start abrogating it right away. Mm. Then you can say, well, why would we negotiate a treaty with you? Why would you negotiate? That's right. Well, we don't have to because we just need to get them papers now and stamp them. And that's sign. true. You get, you get yeah. everything. And the thing is, you don't have a treaty. But the thing is, that when you do the paperwork, yeah, you send it to the Governor General, you send it to the Queen, you send it to the... But when, they, when they're talking about this treaty process now, um, and we do that there, the, we just need to know exactly where do we register those, that information, that, our action. So where do we register the treaty? Well, there'd be a register of treaties in New York. New York, yes. So this is something we're going to have to pursue. Find, we can do the work, yeah. and we can do the work, you know, like I know the Yorty Auto who just arrived. But the arrived definition doesn't say way. registered. Yeah. Doesn't, it just said... Concluded. Concluded. Yep. So we let the world know that we've concluded this thing. <laughs> yeah, you publicise it. We publicise right. it. You go yeah. on to CNN or something. That's right. And one of the good things about going on to CNN, I've already been on BBC in London mm. talking about the independence of my people and that we did the Declaration of Independence and we're a new state. I've been on the, AB, on, the on the BBC in London talking about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it, and it went worldwide. Um, to 200 nations, mm -hmm. you know, that program. So it was a live program and I was sitting there and she was interview, interview, interviewing me about the independence of our state. And then they put the map up that I showed you, even in the background, so <laughs> they were interviewing me. So, so the position now is that I think a lot of us, like you mob now, yeah? See, you mob already got your country defined. You know exactly where you are. And so you're a long way ahead. The Kimberley, the Kimberley mob are waiting for this stuff now for me to get it back because they have their country, they, they own it, they have their governance. So we have a number of areas in Australia that we can do things straight away now without hesitation and really choke these bastards, yeah? And, and <laughs> you mob down there, you're ready. The Yorta Yorta are ready. They've made, Yorta Yorta have made their decisions. Michael, my day's work is done. You've done very well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Uh, we have about a ten-minute break. And uh, by the way, people, um, this set, this uh, conference is um, is uh, sovereign, sovereign union, but we wouldn't. It would not be possible to have this w without the sponsorship of the Yorta Yorta and the Theolas there. Thank you for that, and uh, welcome. You're just getting into the serious business stuff, so you landed at the right time. <laughs> we'll have a cup of tea and quite a couple of more breaks. <laughs>